Okay. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Leslie Jones. I'm the Director of Museum Affairs and Chief Curator for the Preservation Society of Newport County. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to our first lecture of the fall 2022 season. Um, both those who have joined us in person as well as our friends on Zoom, who um, I hear we have reports of people joining us from Sweden, Canada, and from a car museum in Maine. So welcome online. Um, just in terms of how this evening will flow, uh, we will have three presenters who will each be giving small presentations on their own. I'll then facilitate a, a discussion with them. And then my colleague, Claire Barneywalt over here will be running a microphone around for Q and A. Um, question and answers will only be allowed for audiences that are in person. So I'm, I'm sorry to our friends on Zoom, but if you have questions that still remain, we'll, we'll happily be able to send those off to our present presenters. Um, before I introduce our speakers, I just want to give a little bit of history about how Newport ties into this car connection. Obviously, cars are on a lot of our minds, having just had a successful Concorde d'Elegance that the Audrain put on in Newport last weekend. Um, but our, our friend Alva Vanderbilt Belmont wrote in her memoir about what she called the first ever automobile parade in the world that took place in Newport on September 7th, 1899. So humor me while I go through a bit of her recollections. One amusing affair I got up to was an automobile parade, the first ever held. There have been many since that time, but none were original and beautiful in design and execution than the first one that day when automobiles were still an innovation and a novelty at which everybody stared and many jeered. Those automobiles indeed were far from impressive in appearance and not too perfect in action. Lewis, our coachman, was deeply disgusted when ours was brought home and he was instructed to make a place for it in the coach house. And when it is... And when, as occasionally happened, our auto stalled on Ocean Drive, and we had to send for Lewis to come to rescue with the horses, he was secretly delighted. Every such manifestation of the inferiority of the automobile was a source of gratification to him, and in his eyes, at least a vindication of his low opinion of our latest acquisition. However, the horseless carriage had come to stay. In the first automobile parade, everyone was obliged to drive his own car, James Jarrod, afterward to become the American ambassador to Germany, asked me to drive with him. Our auto decorated as were all the others with masses of beautiful flowers drawn ostensibly by two enormous butterflies. A large field had been prepared and obstacles placed for us to drive around. The obstacles were novel and various, movable and otherwise. There was for assistance, a woman dressed as a nurse who crossed the field with a baby, a doll of course, and a preambulator purposely getting in everybody's way. It was for us to avoid her and to cover the course laid out for us across and, across and around the field without driving into the baby. Another obstacle was one of Mr. Belmont's dog carts with a servant in livery seated in it and a wooden horse in the shafts. It had to be an effigy, of course, because no real horse at the time would have stood or remained controllable in the midst of all those automobiles. Coming home very late that evening, electric lights gleamed among the flowers with which our cars were decorated. We looked like a procession out of fairyland. So that's a recollection of Alva Belmont's um, first ever car parade, so she says. Uh, and now it's my, my, my privilege to introduce um, the, our speakers this evening. Uh, Robert Signum will be presenting first. He has served as the curator of the Citizens Motor Car Company, America's Packard Museum since July, 2019. He is a life member of Packard Automobile Classics, as well as a member of the Antique Automobile Association of America, the Classic Car Club of America, Alfa Romeo Owners Club, Society of Automotive Historians, and the American Alliance of Museums. Rob became the youngest voting member of the Packard Automobile Classics Board of Trustees when he founded Tomorrow's Packard Owners in 1992. Howard Kroplick, our next speaker, is a historian, author, creator of an award-winning automobile website and a leading expert on the Vanderbilt Cup races and the Long Island Motor Parkway. While serving as, town, as a town of North Hempstead historian from 2012 to 2019, he was awarded the 2016 Edmund J. Winslow Local Government Historian Award for Excellence, given to one New York historian each year. He has authored two books related to automobile racing history, the Vanderbilt Cup uh, Races of Long Island and the Long Island Motor Parkway. He created the website VanderbiltCupRaces.com, that's a plug for his website, <laughs> uh, dedicated to the history of automobile racing and car culture on Long Island. And the International Academy of Digital Arts and Sciences 
selected as one of the best five in the world for car sites and car culture. Uh, Madeline Jedkowalski is a curator of Meadowbrook Hall in Rochester, Rochester, Michigan. Uh, Meadowbrook Hall was constructed between 1926 and 1929 and commissioned by Matilda Dodge Wilson, the widow of the titan of Detroit's automobile industry, John F. Dodge. With a goal of expanding the story and historical interpretation of the estate, Madeline has direct, directed new tour initiatives, funding programs and restoration projects on the estate, which includes more than a 75,000 piece collection of objects, 25 acres of gardens and historic buildings. Since leading an, exhi an exhibit for the centennial anniversary of the Dodge Brothers Motor Car Club in 2014, she's become an expert on the lives and legacies of the Dodge Brothers and a committed partner to the Dodge Brothers Car Club and the Dodge family. I also had the pleasure of working with Madeline a few years ago when I was um, consulting with Meadowbrook Hall. Uh, so we'll again hear from Robert first. Um, and with that, I'm going to introduce Robert. Please help me welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Rob Signum, and I am the curator of America's Packard Museum, located in Dayton, Ohio. Uh, I wanted to say thank you to the Preservation Society of Newport County, uh, and Laura and Kate Patterson for putting this together. Thank you all so much for having me this evening. Um, when many of us think of the Packard motor car, we think of the great classic cars of the 1920s and 30s, uh, opulent, beautiful styling, sophisticated engineering, a, a true luxury car uh, during uh, a very difficult era in American history. Um, some of us think about the largest independent auto manufacturer based in Detroit. But in fact, P Packard had far more humble beginnings in November of 1899 in the small town of Warren, Ohio. Um, so uh, there is a famous story that accompanies uh, the founding of Packard, uh, Packard Motor Car Company, which was originally called the Ohio Automobile Company uh, for several years until they changed the name wisely, if I, I think so myself. Um, and um, we'll get to that in just a moment. But um, there are, of course, uh, a number of things that early automobile manufacturers needed um, to create these cars. And um, one of them, of course, was capital. Um, one of them, you know, th there are many, many things. Um, uh, in this case, uh, we have Warren Packard, the uh, father of the Packard brothers. Sorry, just one second. That's all right. Oh, thank you. Oh, great. Excuse me. Um, Warren Packard um, was a, an autodidact. Uh, he did not have any formal education. Um, he was, uh, uh, he had settled uh, in uh, what was a, a new, the new state of Ohio. Um, and uh, he had the largest chain of hard goods stores, hardware stores from Pittsburgh to Cleveland and uh, ultimately Columbus. Um, he had uh, an iron foundry. He owned a lumber mill, in fact, several lumber mills by the time of his death. Um, so here are the a number of composite parts of building early automobiles because they could be built by hand, unlike what we think of today or even in mid-century of the creation of individual automobiles. So um, I'm reminded of a, a joke that my father used to tell, um, and it's not so much a joke, but uh, an apocryphal story uh, between um, the uh, John D. Rockefeller Sr. and Jr. And John Rockefeller Sr. was known famously for only tipping a dime. And his son was an extravagant tipper. And when asked by a notable publication why Sr. only tipped a dime, he said, well, it's easy. I don't have a rich old man. Uh, the two younger Packard brothers did. He was a fairly wealthy man at this time uh, in the late 1800s, and he was able to send both of his sons to college. Warren Packard, uh, among these companies that I just discussed, Packard Cook and Company is the hardware company, um, Packard and Barnum Iron Company, uh, Packard Abel and, and Austin uh, was the uh, lumber company. Um, you know, his father, Warren's father, actually ran away from the family to be a 49er to California and to seek his fortune in gold. So there is this idea of hitting it rich 
and um, the new fad in the family that sort of runs in the family at this time. He actually uh, was, Jay Gould offered to buy his ironworks business and a lot of his hardware business as Gould is expanding the railway ever west. Um, and uh, what ultimately became the Baltimore and Ohio, uh, a lot of the railroad ties and ironwork came from Packard Cook and Packard Abel. Um, uh, Terry Martin, who is, a you know, unequivocally, the uh, most important early Packard historian said that um, he was a man of great vision and optimism. Uh, this was brought to his children in spades. Um, the two brothers older is William Dowd Packard on the right, younger James Ward Packard uh, were both educated at university. Uh, William Dowd uh, studied business at the Ohio State University uh, in Columbus and um, had, showed a natural aptitude for business at a young age. Um, uh, William Dowd was actually running the telegraph office uh, in Warren, Ohio at the age of 11, um, and which was located at Packard Cook and Company, strangely enough. But um, he showed an early aptitude to be a successful uh, and entrepreneurial uh, soul. James Ward Packard, on the other hand, was always taking things apart and not as often putting them back together. Um, some of us know people like this. Um, he went on to get his electrical engineering degree from Lehigh University in the mid 1880s, uh, a university still known for their excellence in uh, electrical engineering. Um, and actually Packard number one is located at Lehigh University. If you happen to be in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, uh, you can see it proudly displayed there in the Packard Hall of engineering. Um, these two brothers ultimately became a really great match for the creation of a new company. Um, here, are, here is a family that has a lot of resources, not just financial, but also physical. Um, and these two dynamic young men were very excited about this um, horseless carriage age. Um, even before they got really excited about automobiles, they founded the New York and Ohio Company, which was uh, an electrical wiring and lamp company. And um, after his studies at Lehigh, uh, James Ward went to New York and he um, worked with a number of electrical firms in New York. And he was um, uh, interested in electrifying cities further west. So they were selling their wiring and their lamps to cities and municipalities farther and farther west across the United States. Um, that was their primary business when, um, uh, well, New York and Ohio company you see on the left selling lamps. And actually, actually uh, Packard Electric stayed on for many years, was ultimately purchased by General Motors. Um, and today we know it as Delco or Delphi. Uh, Packard Electric uh, managed to survive all of Packard Motor Cars woes of the 1950s. Um, they, one of the things that actually set them apart at this time is they were working with um, rubber uh, vulcanizers um, to create uh, the first waterproof electric cable. Um, and this is something that uh, the Packard brothers had an, an early patent on and it attracted the attention of other automobile manufacturers, most notably locally, Alexander Winton uh, from Cleveland who was already producing automobiles very early on. In 1895, the American automobile really took off. Although he built his first car in 1893, Frank Durier of Springfield, Massachusetts was uh, showing the Durier motor wagon farther and farther across the country. Um, we have the Chicago Times Herald race occurring two years after um, the Columbian Exposition in Chicago, uh, only six to eight months after that exposition, the World's Fair really had closed. Um, and it began at Jackson Pier and it went all the way up to Evanston. And if you've ever driven in Chicago without traffic, which I know is rare, but you know that you can probably make that trip up to Evanston and back in just over an hour. Uh, it took them just over nine hours to make that trip in all single cylinder uh, engines. Uh, but the Durier won, and really the American consciousness was captured. Uh, this was a highly publicized event all across the country with uh, uh, headlines like the horse is doomed and warning gasoline automobiles. Um, you know, you can imagine uh, if we have uh, 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 obstacle courses with nurses and babies, what people might have thought about the advent of the automobile. 
Uh, this is a picture on the right of the tr uh, track, a small picture of what it would have been like on that race in 1895. People are really catching the bug and so are the Packard brothers. They are doing quite well with the New York and Ohio company. They're making a fair amount of money in a fairly new industry. Uh, they, um, James Ward and his wife travel to Europe and they see a Didion Bouton quadricycle, um, which was, um, a, uh, by James Ward's account, a sad and complicated affair. Um, he bought one after he had returned to Warren, Ohio. And unfortunately, uh, American roads were far inferior to European roads. They often weren't paved, muddy, uh, rutted, and uh, full of obstructions. Uh, so this was a very uncomfortable machine, but James Ward started taking it apart and trying to figure out how he could make his own automobile. Uh, we fast forward to 1898, when after doing some electrical wiring business with the Winton Motor Company, um, Henry, uh, uh, James Ward Packard, excuse me, uh, purchases his first Winton automobile. This is again, a, a single cylinder Winton. Now here is where the apocryphal story starts. The story normally goes that Mr. Packard drove that car about 80 miles back to Warren, Ohio, and it took him many, many hours and there were several breakdowns. And he was so frustrated that he had the car towed by horse, by coach and four, back to Mr. Winton's factory in Cleveland and said, this is terrible, I want my money back. And Mr. Winton said, why don't you try building a car yourself, Mr. Packard, and slammed the door on him. In fact, this Winton was purchased in August of 1898. There were some breakdowns and Mr. Winton did not want to disappoint James Ward Packard. So in fact, he sent his foreman and chief mechanic down uh, on the train uh, to Warren, Ohio to repair the car at James Ward's house. Um, multiple times uh, he sent William Hatcher down. Remember that name, uh, William Hatcher, um, because Winton was trying to make it right. There's three months where we don't hear anything in James Ward's diary about what's going on with the car. These are winter months and the roads are icy and these cars are unreliable in, in Ohio winter temperatures. Um, and then all of a sudden in the spring, we hear of more breakdowns and more repairs. And in June of 1899, now he takes the car back. You can sympathize with Mr. Winton. I've given you all this free service. I've sent my best people down there. And now you want your money back and to give the car back to me? I think he probably used some stronger language than is reported in history. An era of provocation gave birth to the Packard Motor Car Company. James Ward um, aggressively going back to Alexander Winton time and time again. Winton um, uh, trying to mollify him with his best salesman and marketing genius, George Weiss, saying, you know, Winton's are great cars and this is just a, a difficult one and we'll fix it for you. Uh, Packard ultimately hired George Weiss, uh, a Cleveland native, away from Winton as well as William Hatcher, the chief mechanic, to build the first Model A Packard in November of 1999. And the provocation between these three men um, became a heated one, which spurned them to excellence, spurred them to excellence over the course of the next several years. This is the 1899 Model A. It is the only Packard that is truly labeled an 1899 car, although three to four other Packard cars were built in 1899, but not sold until 1900. Um, Packard was immediate, James Ward Packard was immediately obsessed with what innovations could they use on American cars. Number one is the H pattern shifter. Um, this was invented by Packard, something that we think of as standard in um, standard transmissions. Um, also the steering wheel. Uh, while they have a patent for it in the United States, they were using steering wheels on some vehicles in Europe at this time. Packard was the first one to put it on an American car. Also, some of you know that a spark advance right there in the middle of the steering wheel um, was on a lot of early cars. That was a true Packard first. And then lastly, competition. Um, they were competing in the press, but the most important way to compete was by racing. And we're gonna hear a lot more about this later, but 
through the endurance races that were run from New York to Boston, or uh, New York to Buffalo, excuse me, uh, starting as early as 1902. Uh, that's the picture on the left of the Packard finishing a few years after 02. And um, the Vanderbilt Cup races in Long Island, which were regular races in which people could bring their own vehicles, their, their manufactured vehicles, to vie for attention in the press by winning the race, or at least enduring to the end, were becoming far more common. These races really set the tone for who was buying cars at this time. Um, and before I get to Henry B. Joy, who brought the company to Detroit and really changed it and um, modernized it for that time, um, I will say, actually, it was Henry B. Joy um, who went to the first New York automobile show in 1901, and he saw the Packard, uh, at that point, Model C, uh, I believe, and um, that uh, that particular car piqued his interest so much. He was a young, um, wealthy man from Detroit, and he uh, got a lot of other uh, Detroit financiers to invest in the company. It, it's that at that same time that Packard is expanding beyond Ohio, and they sell the rights to their first dealership outside of Ohio. In fact, the second dealership in the United States. This is on Broadway in the 400s, which... I think is actually someplace around Canal Street, if you could imagine um, automobile dealerships being on Broadway around Canal Street. Um, and those people who founded that dealership in New York, they summered in Newport. So in fact, the third Packard automobile dealership in the country was right here in Newport, Rhode Island. Um, I'm still trying to find out the address for those of you who are excited about it. Henry B. Joy bought into the company with his Detroit investors and really changed the face of the company. Um, he was trying to bring the company to Detroit where all of the other major players were and make Packard a major player on the scene. It was known at this time as a very reliable car. Whether it was fast, whether it was a good hill climber, these things were also important to consumers. But the reliability factor was very important for the early consumers of horseless carriages. And Packard really stood head and shoulders above a number of other auto manufacturers at this time. Joy wanted to capitalize on that reputation by um, starting the slogan, ask the man who owns one. Uh, at America's Packard Museum, we also say ask the woman and ask the family who owns the one. Um, but ask the man who owns one, it became the right kind of person-to-person -person marketing that Packard wanted for Packard owners to share their experiences with other um, potential car buyers. It was also one of the most expensive cars of the day, but you would get a reliable car and you would get personalized service. Packards were often personalized at every level, whether it was the body type, the upholstery, special fittings, um, uh, the settle and torch lamps coming later. Um, Packard was ultimately customizable. Um, and Henry B. Joy is famous for saying at the initial board meeting of, of the Detroit and the Ohio board members, let's do something even if it's wrong. Uh, and in this case, history remembers that because he was right. And Packard did go on until they purchased Studebaker in 1954, and the last Packards were made in 1956, and the final Studebaker Packards were made in 1958. But Winton stopped producing cars in the mid-20s. They truly outlasted their initial competitor, and Packard went on to be known as a name for endurance, durability, great engineering, styling, and customized cars. So why don't you build a car yourself, Mr. Packard, may have been the least opportune thing that Alexander Witten could have said at that time. But it did start the, one of the greatest luxury car companies of the United States. Thank you very much. Good evening. Uh, I'm Howard Kroplick, and I'm going to be talking about the incredible Vanderbilt Cup races, the road from Newport to Long Island. And I must say, I've uh, given presentations all around the United States, but I have never been in a site this beautiful. It's fantastic. And, and the, uh, the Preservation Society of Newport should be congratulated for their efforts in preserving these beautiful properties. It's really amazing. You do a great job. Okay, it's not showing up. 
There we go. So here's the outline for my presentation. For the next two hours, we'll be talking. No, we'll only do 15 minutes. I'm going to go by very quickly here. So we're going to talk about William K. Vanderbilt Jr., who is really the hero of this presentation. And we'll talk about his role in Newport and uh, his racing career. And he created the Vanderbilt Cup races, which ran from 1904 to 1910. And here he is. This is uh, William K. Vanderbilt Jr. He's only about 23 years old in this photo. And he always wanted to look older. So he always wore, had a mustache over here. And he was, uh, he was the son of uh, William K. Vanderbilt and Alva Vanderbilt. And he was the great grandson of Cornelius Vanderbilt. And he was the heir to the railroad fortune of the Vanderbilt fortune. And I have like about 25,000 images of the Vanderbilt Cup races, the Motor Parkway. And this is one of the, uh, the this, this photo makes me smile every time because it shows the Vanderbilt family and friends in 1887. And they're taking a cruise down the Nile. And you can see in the middle of the picture, you have nine-year-old Willie Kay, his uh, sister Consuelo Vanderbilt is to the left there. She later becomes the Duchess of Marlborough. Uh, her father uh, and Willie Kay's father is to the left there, uh, William, William K. Vanderbilt, and the very famous Alva Vanderbilt. You could be see sitting on the right there. And also, you see there's a whole bunch of friends of the Vanderbilt family, and you have OHP Belmont, who was William K. Vanderbilt's best friend, who was on the cruise sitting sit in the front row to the left. Now, uh, What's interesting about this, soon after this cruise, uh, William K. Vanderbilt and Alva Vanderbilt divorced a couple of years later. I think it was about eight years after the cruise. And then one year after the divorce, Alva married Belmont. So it was kind of interesting that they were all kind of meeting in this uh, cruise over there. So another important point in Willie K.'s life was in 1899 when he married a Virginia Bertie Fair. And uh, he was only 21 years old. Uh, Virginia Fair was uh, about three years older. And I think there was an arrangement there between the families. The Fair family uh, was extremely uh, well known. They all summered here in Newport. And the Fair family made their money from the Comstock Lodge load. Uh, in a silver mine. They also did the Fairmont hotels eventually as well. And after this uh, wedding, they, uh, they went off for their honeymoon at Idle Hour in Center Reach, New York. And the night of, after the wedding, Idle Hour burnt down. So <laughs> they had to run out and, and be rescued from their own honeymoon. Mansions. So that was not a good start to the, to, the, to the marriage. And where we are today, Rosecliff, is related to the Fair family. Uh, Virginia Fair's sister, Tessie, she helped build this along with Bertie. So we're, we're linking in here as well to uh, the Vanderbilt family right in our location. Now, Leslie mentioned the Newport Automobile Parade. I'm gonna show you images from that parade. And that parade, I think it was supposed to be a bit of a lock, but it really was very significant and was really highlighted in many of the automobile trade magazines as a significant automobile event. And here in this picture here, you see uh, Willie K. Vanderbilt and his new bride going down the street right in front of us, Bellevue Avenue in their parade. And they went, they started out at Belcourt Castle. So it was Alva Vanderbilt uh, uh, Belmont who really organized this parade. And it started out at Belcourt Castle and they had obstacles there. They had uh, different types of barriers. They had fake baby carriages. And so the, the cars to start the parade had to go through this obstacle course. Some of them didn't make it when they were making the turns, the cars collapsed. So this was a, a very big event. 
And uh, the cars themselves were very, uh, they were decorated with floral displays and wreaths, as you'll see here. And here's some of the cars that were on, in this parade. Here's uh, on the left, you see Tessie Olix. Uh, and you can see on the bottom, the car crashed in one of the obstacles. So they don't look too happy there. They didn't make the parade. They, they couldn't get off the obstacle course. Alva Vanderbilt uh, Belmont, as she described, Leslie described, there's her car, very fancy. And that's uh, Mrs. Uh, Jacob Astor's car there. So you had, this was an opportunity for high society all to get together to show off their new automobiles. And remember, this is just the birth of the automobiles here. The only people who owned the automobiles here were the extremely wealthy. And uh, a lot of times they were chauffeurs would driven it, but here in Newport, they loved driving their cars. So they, this was at the very early stage of the automobile starting to explode. And here, what I told you before is that the trade magazines picked this up. And this is uh, Automobile Magazine, October 1899. And you can see here that he describes this parade is it like it was amazing. It was, they were thousands of people with line street right in front of us, Bellevue Avenue, looking at these, these cars. And they, they ended up in Belmont's farm in Middleton. And then they came back at night and it was just an amazing event for everybody to see. And you could see the, the author here was describing it. And he was describing a, a, one of the horse drivers was following this parade. And he, I love the last line he, he says here, to him and his startling steeds, it was like a whiff of the century to come. So here you, you really have the advent of the automobile and it's really signified by this wonderful Newport automobile parade. Now, Willie K. Vanderbilt, he was, he was like taken by the speed and the automobile, it became his real passion. And he decided that he was going to continue the tradition of automobiles in Newport. And so in 1900, he organized the 1900 Newport automobile races and at Quidneck Park, which was a horse track in near to Newport here. And you can see in this picture here, it was again, a, a very high society event Everybody came with their finest clothes, and it was a race between all the high society uh, in Newport. And of course, Willie Kay, he was, always has the fastest car, and the, the, he, he was determined to always win the races. And sure enough, he won most of the races he competed in. And here he was driving a Dampler, a, a German car. So, so he would always purchase the most a powerful European car he could get. And at that time, the European cars were far better and more sturdy and more powerful than the American cars. So this was a very successful race. So what does he do the next year? He has the second coming of these Newport automobile races in 1902, but he wants to race down the, the public streets here in Newport, uh, that didn't go too well. So he was, they, they, and he was always getting into trouble. He was always in his car, speeding down Bellevue Avenue, getting tickets, and he was not too happy, but he took his racing idea and went back to a Quidnick Park. And he, uh, again, set up a races with, between him and his high society friends. And you can see on the, uh, the left there, there's a, a, a program from the, from the races. And I've collected all things related to the Vanderbilt Cup races. And I'm fortunate I actually have a copy of this 1901 program too, describing these wonderful races in Newport. And here, of course, uh, Willie, uh, Willie Kay was the champion of this race. And here you can see he's in a, uh, a 1902 Mercedes, uh, the Red Devil. So he, he was a pretty powerful car there. He won all the major races again at the, in, for Newport. But at this point, 
he decided that he, he became a little bit bored. He said he wanted to compete with really uh, high level, high level racers. So what does he do? He goes to Europe. And so for two years, he's racing throughout Europe. And this is a, a, a picture of Willie Kay on the left there at the uh, Paris to Madrid race. This was races between cities. These were road races. And he's in a French car, it's called the Moors. And look at what he's wearing as a crash helmet, a little felt derby. So, and also as my wife likes to say, look at the tires, look how thin they are. So these cars, they, 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 they looked like they could go fast and they, they were going anywhere from about 50 to 100 miles per hour, but they were not durable. And matter of fact, the Paris to Madrid race, there were a lot of deaths. And the only thing that uh, saved Willie Kay in that race was that his car broke down on the first day. Um, but he was very successful as a race car driver too. Um, that's a, the cover of a French magazine called him the, the millionaire record man. He would set records for in his cars. So he was extremely successful as a race car driver, but I don't think Bertie really wanted him racing around in these cars too. So she said, you got to come back uh, to the United States and settle down a little bit. And what did he do? He, he continued to race. Here he is in 1904, and this was the heyday of Vanderbilt's racing. And in January of 1904, he is in a, a uh, Mercedes, a 1903 Mercedes, and he goes 92 miles per hour over a one-mile track, setting the uh, land speed record. So at this point, uh, Bertie said, that's enough. No more racing for you. You need to do some focus on something else. And you can see the trade magazines really focused on Willie K. Vanderbilt as a major pioneer in automobile and auto racing. And they say he's a champion and he seeks other worlds to conquer. So what are the other worlds that he wants to conquer? You remember he had experience doing road races in Europe. There was no road races ever in the United States. And so he comes up with the idea of doing a Vanderbilt Cup race. So he wants to bring the best drivers from Europe to compete with the best drivers in the United States. His goal, he said, was really to upgrade American manufacturers to get to the same standards that they had in Europe. I actually think he had another goal. It was to have a lot of fun, you know, that he, he really had a great passion for it. And he had the, the races. He didn't do it in Newport. He came to Long Island, which where he was raised, where his family was raised. They were originally from Staten Island and they moved to Long Island. He lived in Lake Success. And so he brought this, the Vanderbilt Cup races to Long Island. And you can see in the cup itself, it's a, it's a huge uh, 31 inch cup. And it was always also the William K. Vanderbilt junior race. It was never the Vanderbilt Cup races. He wanted to put his name on this and stand out between the many, many Vanderbilts that were out there. And you can see on the other side of the cup was him in his Mercedes at uh, Daytona Beach. Here's the course that was laid out for the first Vanderbilt Cup race in uh, October uh, 1904. The course itself was about a 30 mile circular course done on public roads. So they had to get permission to, uh, to get the, they had to close all the public roads on a Saturday and uh, the farmers were fighting them. It was only like three days before the race that they got approval to do it. So here you have uh, the, uh, the course itself. It was 30 miles and they did 10 laps. So this was about a 300 mile race. It took about five hours to complete. Now, if you see that on the map, there's two stars and people sometimes ask, why were you always interested in the Vanderbilt Cup races? Well, the star in the middle of that triangle, triangular course, that's where I was brought up in East Meadow. We have somebody in here in the audience also from East Meadow. And then the other star to the north of that, that's where I live now. So this was always an area 
I heard about these things, but it never got publicized. So I said, I really wanted to start researching the Vanderbilt Cup races. Now, here's how they promoted it. This was the, the posters uh, throughout Long Island. Automobile races, Nassau County highways, three exclamation points, four, three exclamation, the first international road race, which it was in the United States. And you can see here, it was, it's not the Vanderbilt Cup race, it's the William K. Vanderbilt Jr. Cup race, Saturday, October 8th. And here, Robert made me put this up, this slide. No, he didn't. But this is uh, one of the, the American cars. This is the Packard Gray Wolf. And uh, you can see here that that's at the start line. And then you can see it making one of the turns. And I'm going to show you something uh, again with the Packard in a little bit that's kind of very exciting. So remember, they were fighting this, uh, the, the concept of the Vanderbilt Cup races. And only about three days before, they, uh, they were able to uh, get the go-ahead for it. So there's not, a lot of, uh, there's not a lot of memorabilia associated with the 1904 race, except for this program over here. It's the only thing that you can find from the 1904 races, which describes all the cars in there, including the Packard Gray Wolf. Now here, there's another great photo here. This is um, a photo of the officials stand and uh, the press box. And you can see, they just put this up like the week before, but there's something in this photo. There's a couple of things in this photo that are, are very interesting. Um, the first thing on the track there, wearing the, the little hat, that's Willie K. Vanderbilt. And he is always the referee for all the Vanderbilt Cup races. I don't think Birdie let him race in it. And he said it wasn't the, the gentleman thing to do to compete in a race that you're basically the sponsor for. Now, there's something else on the roof. Does anybody notice anything on the roof that's of interest? A camera. Very good. That's one point over there. There's a camera. This is the first, one of the first sporting events that was filmed. And they saw this, uh, this photo, but for years, nobody could ever find a film of the 1904 race. And then uh, in 1976, they were knocking down a wall at the US Patent Office, and they found behind this wall hundreds of movie clips, movie reels, that they were used to, to put a copyright on this. And one of them was the Vanderbilt Cup race of 1904. So we are fortunate that was saved, and I'm gonna show you that right now. It's a two minute clip of the Vanderbilt Cup race of 1904. And it will, the condition is absolutely amazing. So no one touched it for all these years. And let's take a look at it. You can see thousands of people. Remember, this was taken from the top of that little roof. Watch what happens when the car goes by. They go right onto the course. They have no idea what an automobile race or how dangerous this car race could be. About 25,000 spectators lined the entire course. And you also notice, because of the fragile nature of the car, two people are in the car, the driver and the mechanician. Here's the mass of people turn. I love the first clip, look at the car, get the, the horse carriage getting turned off. Those are flagmen indicating the car is coming. Here's a Mercedes from Germany. This is from France, Fernand Gabriel. He won the Paris to Madrid race. These are Panhards, 90 horsepower, very powerful cars. Hey, there's the Grey Wolf. This is the only known film of the Grey Wolf racing. There's a Fiat from Italy. George Heath won this race in one of those Packards. But with every Vanderbilt Cup race, there were problems controlling the crowd. Here's the winner of the race. But look what happens when he goes past the grandstand. I love the gentleman in the front there. Here comes the car. And there they go, right onto the course. These cars are going 75 miles per hour down straight away here. 
Yeah, looking. Where's the car? When's the next car coming? 21 year old Albert Clement placed second in a car built by his father. Pretty streamlined for the day. And here he comes down the straightaway. And what do you think the crowd's going to do? They're going to go on the other side. After finishing the race, Clement protested to Willie Kay that he was unfairly stopped by the, the referees, and that's why he lost. And so there you can see Willie Kay acting as a referee. Pretty amazing film, isn't it? So what happened to the Vanderbilt Cup races? After 1904, it was a sensation. It got publicity in all the newspapers. It was made the page one of the New York Times. They ran the Vanderbilt Cup races five more times on Long Island. They drew crowds. In 1910, they drew crowds of up to a quarter of a million people. I mean, it was amazing. The population of Nassau County, where it was held, was only about 50,000. So everybody came in from New York City by trains but they could never control the crowds. You could see how excited they were. They, they tried, they had uh, Irish volunteers with rifles, they had fencing. It never, they always had problems. And in uh, 1910, they had two fatalities associated with it. So it was, it was gone from Long Island. It, it continued around the country from Savannah out to Santa Monica and stopped in 1916, just before World War I began. And what's the significance of the Vanderbilt Cup races? It was the first international road race in the United States. It's still one of the largest sporting events with the largest attendance ever in the history of sporting events in the United States. It helped promote the use of the automobile. As we say here, it, it was the advent of the automobile and the Vanderbilt Cup races really gave tremendous publicity to automobiles, including Henry Ford, who attended uh, the race and said, you know what, there might be a market here for less expensive cars. It was responsible for the development of improvements in US cars. That was one of the goals of Vanderbilt. And it also improved the parkways in 1908. Uh, Vanderbilt and his business associates built a road specifically for automobiles. It was the first road built for automobiles called the Long Island Motor Parkway. And it also established the need for protected automobile racing. Can't do it on the public roads. And also the need for professional race car drivers. Now I gave you the quick two hour presentation in about 15 minutes or close to it. If for more information, you could go to my website, VanderbiltCupRaces.com. I've been doing this now for uh, 14 years of information. And if you Google Newport, you'll see a lot of information about the, the Newport races and the Newport parade. And then I also have, as Leslie says, we have some books here. Uh, you can get that online at Arcadia. Vanderbilt Cup races and the Motor Parkway. And I can blatantly promote it because all of the, all the proceeds go to my favorite nonprofit organization where I'm co-president, the Rosalind Landmark Society. Thank you very much for your attention. Hello, I am so happy to be here, such a beautiful spot. I am gonna be telling you a little bit about the history and the legacy of Dodge Brothers Motor Car Company, some of the history. Um, and their career was really, their career in the automotive industry was really bookended by two important automobile shows. Um, one in 1901, where they were spotted by Henry Ford for the first time. And then one in 1920, where both Dodge Brothers ended up falling ill and they both died within the year. Um, like many of the early automotive manufacturers, the Dodge Brothers were interested in, in racing and um, building, and they were really um, especially interested in inventing and machining. This is John and Horace um, 
Horace is always the one with the the big mustache down at the the bottom, and then John is at his right, a little bit taller. That is them in Detroit around 1892 at Murphy's Boiler Works. It was one of their first kind of gigs. They traveled around Michigan following different jobs in manufactories until landing there. John Dodge ended up getting tuberculosis and could no longer work in this factory. Um, and this had a huge impact on the Dodge brothers in several ways. John Dodge, because he couldn't work, his brother Horace, they were very close with each other um, and from pretty blue collar, humble beginnings. Uh, he, Horace got a second job to help support John Dodge's family during this time. So they realized these people who they would soon end up employing themselves when they um, moved up in the world, that if they had an accident or some kind of illness uh, that prevented them from working, that they would that the family would maybe be on the street. Also, Horace's job was with a man named Henry Leland, and Henry Leland would later uh, go on to recommend the Dodge brothers and their machining skills, and Horace learned them right there during that, that time. It also caused the Dodge brothers, once John had recovered a little bit, to go together to uh, Windsor, which is right across the river from Detroit um, in, in Canada. And they go across and they seek a slightly cleaner job in a topography um, manufacturing company. And while there, they have their first foray into the transportation industry. In his backyard garage, Horace invents a bicycle bearing for a bicycle. And if you think of the progression of personal transportation, in the 1890s, bicycles were pretty cool. You didn't have to feed them. You didn't have to tie them up anywhere. You didn't have to have a, a barn in your backyard to hold your horse and carriage. Um, so bicycles, the Dodge Brothers actually... Um, so with this bicycle bearing, they started the Evans and Dodge Bicycle Company, actually out of this topography um, factory in, in Windsor with Fred Evans, their manager there. So they're building the bicycles right out of that factory. And they ran ads that said, if you're a doctor, you can save your patients' lives if you ride our bicycle. Um, because what Horace's bicycle did that was especially special, his ball bearing was that it was an enclosed system so you didn't have to stop your riding your bicycle and clean out the ball bearings because all of the dust from the streets had gotten in them and clogged them and you'd have to stop and keep going. So this enclosed bicycle bearing meant that you could ride your bike a little bit longer with some maintenance because if you think again of, of any kind of these early um, vehicles there's a lot of maintenance that you needed to do with, with them, um, even with bicycles. So the Dodge um, bike was, was pretty dependable. But by the time you get to like eight, so they started their company in 1895. By the time you get to 1899, the Dodge brothers have seen that the bicycle as accessible as it was for the general public, which is one of the things they always wanted to do, it was not gonna be the future. It was gonna be the automobile. So the Dodge brothers leave, Evans and Dodge, they move back to Detroit. They rent a factory before building the factory that's down on the lower left there in Detroit. And they start advertising themselves as machinists and engineers. And it's um, Henry Leland again, who comes back and says to Ransom Olds, who is gonna be building the first mass produced automobile in America um, and the world. The first mass produced means he's not just building one car at a time, he's building 2000 cars. We're not at the point of interchangeable parts for cars. You can't really take them apart and have every part be exactly the same, but they're kind of as close as they can get. So Ransom Olds, because of Henry Leland's recommendation, he asked the Dodge brothers to build engines for him. And then he has them, he asked them to build the transmissions for them in 1901. So this was a, a huge break for the Dodge brothers. They build this new factory. They are spending a lot of money on trying to grow their business. And they're approached by a man with two failed car companies behind him. He wants the Dodge brothers by his side. They had a great reputation for machining by this point. He wants them there as he starts his third car company. They agree, and that was Henry Ford and Ford Motor Company. He had seen one of the Dodge brothers engines at that 1901 auto show in Detroit. Um, Detroit actually had the first auto show. The auto shows in the beginning were more like trying to get the public to come and be around a vehicle and see if they wanted to maybe purchase one. And of course, it's going to be changing quite a bit as it still is today. But at that first um, one 
Henry Ford's very impressed with the Dodge brothers' work. One of the reasons they might have decided to go with Ford, um, because taking this, this job with Ford, they would be building everything for Ford Motor Company except for the wheels, the body, and the seats. So they were pretty much building the entire car almost, except then it had to be taken on a horse-drawn carriage to Ford Motor Company, and they put the wheels on it. Um, I like the juxtaposition of a horse-drawn carriage taking these nearly completed vehicles because they didn't have the wheels, but... Henry Ford is pretty much just assembling the cars, the Dodge Brothers are building them. Um, and that was in 1902 that they decided to work for Henry Ford. And for the next decade, they are building 60% of the parts for Ford Motor Company, Incredible, um, incredibly integral to the success of that. And they might have decided to go with Ford because like a lot of these people, they were interested in racing. The Dodge brothers raced bicycles and boats, but they were there in 19... Um, Oh, uh, three when, or sorry, 1904, it was the, the winter after um, when Henry Ford raced his 999 on the Lake St. Um, Lake St. Clair outside of Detroit. And he won a new land speed record of 91.37 miles per hour. It only lasted a few weeks, um, but Ford was recognized for that. And the Dodge brothers, I think, liked being around someone who's interested in racing. Um, the Dodge Brothers, so this is the Ford Paquette plant that Henry Ford ends up building before he's just renting a factory, while the Dodge Brothers had spent $60,000 building this factory and tooling it and hiring 120 workers so they can make all these ports, parts for Ford. Um, and a few years later, Henry Ford's able to build the Ford Paquette plant. And here's a picture of the, a very early photograph of the inside of the plant. And uh, it was there that Henry Ford is developing the Model uh, T. Um, and to this is a photograph of the Ford um, uh, employees on one of the Dodge Brothers boats that they had celebrating the birth of the Model T, which of course put America on wheels. And this, um, the badge on the right hand side, you might recognize it's an employee badge for an automotive company. This was actually dropped off anonymously to Meadowbrook. It was like the best gift um, ever that I got. And it was not stolen from anywhere. I checked with all the other car museums and everything. And it was, it was clear. I, I don't know where it came from, but this was John Dodge's badge to go anywhere in Henry Ford's factory at, at, at this one pickup plant. What's more interesting is because of the logo, we know that this badge has to date to about 1913, which is when the Dodge brothers told Henry Ford that they were no longer going to be building parts for him. If you know anything about Henry Ford, he wasn't very happy, but John Dodge as vice president of Ford Motor Company and the bearer of this badge was still able to go anywhere in the factory because they were still building parts for Henry Ford at this point, even though they knew that they were going to be making their own car. So pretty, pretty important badge. And I want to give you a little bit idea of, of how Dodge Brothers is really growing because of their work with Henry Ford at this time. Henry Ford, one of the, the biggest kind of changers was that he was unable, he was very cash poor, especially with this kind of third um, break in or attempt to break into the automotive industry. So he was unable to pay the Dodge Brothers for the parts in those early 1903 type of years. And the Dodge Brothers took 10% stock in the company in exchange. That made them millionaires within a few years. And of course, Henry Ford was as well. So that little Dodge Brothers factory that they built in 1901, which you can see at the top left, it is gonna be expanding from um, about 13,800 13, square feet until when they start their own car company in 1914, it becomes 23 acres. That is that picture at the bottom. Um, yeah, and then it is going to become 120 acres by 1921. Hamtramck, which is this little town outside of kind of town outside of Detroit City, but that's that's almost like Dodge Dodge Land. It was where this factory was. 
And with expansion, of course, you need some more labor and who better to help with a new business than hiring a secretary. And so Matilda Rausch on the left side here, this is, um, she was the um, born in Canada. She was the daughter of German immigrants. Her parents had a saloon in Detroit and Matilda didn't go to high school, but she did go to secretarial school and business college. And she learned um, how to not, just type, but to also do some financial planning and business management. She was hired by John Dodge right about the time of this Ford contract. They ended up falling in love and got married five years after she'd stopped working for him. And um, a year after they married in 1907, so they married in seven, the next year in 08, they bought the first 320 acres of Meadowbrook Farms, which is about an hour outside of Detroit. And it is where Meadowbrook Hall is today. And it was on this property that the Dodge brothers were secretly building and test driving their car because they were still working for Henry Ford. I'm gonna try to go faster. <laughs> so the Dodge brothers campaign um, was founded on secrecy. They didn't tell anyone any of the details of what their car would be. They only depended on their reputation. And they, I think, annoyed their marketing manager so much that he said, well, let's just go with it um, and just rely on their reputation. Um, and it was very, very successful because they, even though they didn't give any information, they only said, we're leaving Ford, basically. We're gonna start our own car. And there were 21,000 dealer applications uh, some of them from Ford dealers, and 72,000 orders placed for the first Dodge Brothers cars in 1914. That's amazing, 72,000 orders, because they absolutely did not make that many cars their first year. Um, people really wanted to see the car. There was a lot of buzz around it, um, but I'm trying to go a little bit faster. Um, so here's the Dodge Brothers car when they they actually, John and Horace, have one of their uh, factory superintendents, um, Guy Emile, drive it out of the Dodge Brothers factory on November 14th, 1914, and they park it in front of John Dodge's house. His wife is actually two weeks away from giving birth, so I like to imagine that she was up there watching, um, and that's why they took the car in front of his house for the publicity photos. Um, I like this quote of um, John Dodge. Just think of all the Ford owners who are someday want to own an automobile. There are a lot of really funny quotes um, from John, and, or John Dodge and Henry Ford who were these huge personalities, um, but they did remain friendly, I think friendly competitors, but the Dodge brothers were obsessed with the quality of their car. And this is the first, as far as I know, um, and. It's, what, what I've learned from my research, this is the first dedicated test track that was built on a, um, on a factory site. The car manufacturers are still road testing their cars on the streets, but this was dedicated to testing their cars. All of the cars that came out of the factory had to go around this circle and up the hill, which we're gonna see in a minute. Um, the Dodge Brothers also did a lot of other kind of ingenious moves in their factory to help their employees. They wanted their employees to be safe while working at the factory. And here is a clip from 1917 of the, a car going up a snow and ice covered um, part of the test track. They're, they're also speeding by <laughs> I'm amazed they backed up and, and then we're still able to make it. I would not have, I would have had to back up more. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, there's also, this is snow, of course, but there was a sand pit that was next to it that the cars also had to go through. Um, John Dodge uh, drove the first cars into a brick wall um, because he said that someone was going to do it, so they might as well see what happened. He also threw the rubber tires off a four-story, the four-story office building because he wanted to see which one stood that test the best, and that's what tire they chose. This was the first all steel body. Um, they had a 12 volt electric start. Other manufacturers used a six volt system, most of them, which would remain the norm until the 1950s. But the Dodge Brothers in 1914 had a 12 volt 
It's a 35 horsepower engine. Um, and um, when they would be going to these car shows each year and re releasing their kind of new vehicle, the Dodge brothers were actually very stubborn about saying, if there's something wrong with our car, we're gonna fix it immediately. We're not gonna keep making cars that we don't like. If there's a part that we wanna change, we're not doing model years, we're just gonna change it. So when they would go to these automobile shows, you just kind of see whatever's there. Maybe it was from two years ago and nothing had been changed. Um, so they really were obsessed with the, the quality of their car. They also um, encouraged the public to send photos and stories of their Dodges and how many miles that they had gotten and um, if they'd survived any harsh conditions. And one of the cars that they tested themselves was the Death Valley Dodge. This is my favorite story that I've uncovered about the Dodge brothers because um, somehow no one really knew the story anymore. So the Death Valley Dodge um, in 1915, they dynamited their way to the base of the Grand Canyon. I know that they did because there's a video that exists and I've not been able to track it down yet. Um, I finally almost found it in New Zealand, but they had been lost. Um, so I haven't found it yet, but it's somewhere maybe behind a wall that someone is gonna knock down. I was like really crossing my fingers when I heard that. It's somewhere, I'll get it someday, but they are the first car to drive in the base of the Grand Canyon. This car, the Death Valley Dodge, then crosses the Death Valley, which car manufacturers still do today to make sure that it can stand that heat. It was 144 degrees. If you think of, I mean, people died trying, trying this, not, not the Death Valley Dodge, it, it made it, but other cars um, and, and to the race car drivers who are mostly doing this. If you think about what happened if you had any issue with your car and you didn't have the parts with it, if you ran out of water, yeah, um, that was that was kind of it. And um, then the picture that um, the Death Valley Dodge in the very left, uh, this I got from the great grandson of the um, the person who owned this dealership in New Jersey. And this is the car then made its way across the United States to New Jersey. And um, all of the little writing on it is all of the cities that it stopped. People would write the name of the, the city and the dealership on it. So they really wanted to show the, the um, quality of, of their vehicles. And I'm, I'm trying to go faster. So um, the Dodge Brothers, there's a story that, and a commercial, because um, I consulted with the Dodge commercials that they did in, in 2014 for the Centennial. They did hand out beer and sandwiches to the Forge workers. Um, they really cared about their employees and they would actually let them come and work at Dodge Brothers or work at Meadowbrook Farms if they needed a break from the factory. And that is the picture on the lower right there. The Dodge Brothers, so when they started in 1914 with an all steel body, there are 65 other car companies that opened in 1914. What's also happening that year that maybe is going to need a lot of steel, World War I is broken out. Even though the United States hadn't entered into the war yet and went for three more years, um, it was hard to get steel almost immediately, and it was difficult for car manufacturers to survive. Dodge Brothers is the only one of the, those 65 that is still around kind of today. And one of the ways that the Dodge Brothers made it was they made recoil mechanisms and mechanized the process to make these for the French um, howitzer guns. They did it um, with a contract with the US government. A really, really great story. They also were involved their cars when um, George, Lieutenant um, George S. Patton, um, used three cars in a successful campaign in Mexico. Um, then General Blackjack Pershing said that they were, the cars were, did so well that that is the only car that his men would be using. So they purchased 250 more Dodges at that point in 1916. And then when the US entered the, into the war effort, they ordered 13,000 automobiles, um, including a thousand ambulances from Dodge Brothers. Um, so the Dodge brothers in 1915, they built 245 cars. So they didn't get that 72,000 orders, um, fulfilled. And by June, 1920, they built and shipped more than 15,000. 
In 1920, we have that next auto show coming. The Dodge brothers are unable to attend their uh, dealer's luncheon. They don't show up because they both had fallen ill from an, an outbreak of the 1918 flu. So it was at the, in New York City at the um, auto show there. And first, Horace fell ill sitting by his bedside. John, who'd had tuberculosis earlier and his lungs were compromised, he also fell ill. John ended up passing away and Horace died really of heartbreak within the year. This is just an FYI, the Dodge brothers are not poisoned. They didn't die of alcohol poisoning because it was during prohibition and Henry Ford did not kill them. Um, <laughs> if, I, if I could tell you how many times I, I hear that um, theory. Um, and then a little bit about what's happening with the Dodge brothers later. So the two Dodge widows sell Dodge brothers for $146 million in cash in 1925 to a Detroit, um, sorry, not a Detroit, a New York bank. It's kind of just to like a holding company is running the company until 1928 when Walter P. Chrysler buys it. He is also named by Time Magazine Person of the Year. And that's what this photograph is. Um, and Dodge Brothers, uh, as the brand is kind of under this Chrysler and some other umbrellas, has still, still exists to this day and still known for its dependability and durability. Uh, oh, I have one more. Here's Meadowbrook Hall. So that's where I work on the, on the top. And we do have vehicles and a Packard and a Dodge's 1938 Packard limousine. Um, and it has 16, under 16,000 miles. It's a really incredible car, but we do have vehicles as part of our collection too that we've been collecting since 2014. This is around for discussion. Thank you so much. Got it on. Great. Thank you so much. That was fascinating and really great perspectives as well. Uh, I think I'm not a car person, but maybe I'll become one. <laughs> um, so we have just a couple of discussion points for our panelists before we get to the question and answer section of the evening. Um, and I think you all have brought very different um, points of view, but also the progression and the time period of when cars really became, well, they were, they were introduced to our world and now we can't live without them essentially. Um, but I'm wondering in the Gilded Age specifically, thinking of the time period when these uh, automobiles were invented, you know, what else, what else was happening society-wise and how much do cars impact how we as a country start to operate um, both in domestically, but also from a commercial perspective? All right. I can take it from, from a standpoint, remember in around 1900, these cars, as I said in the presentation, it was really owned by just the people who could afford not only the car, but also a chauffeur to drive it because they were very difficult to drive. And so it was only around the 1900 to 1910 that there was like a, a change in attitude that the automobiles were not just for the rich. And as I said, in uh, the 1908 Vanderbilt Cup race, Henry Ford, I think it was the 1906 Vanderbilt Cup race, Henry Ford was a, he was one of the directors of the Vanderbilt Cup Commission. And he saw all this enthusiasm and excitement about the automobile there. And I really think it inspired him to, to build a car that was available for people who were not as rich. And so that's where he, I, I think it was one of the inspirations for the Model T came out of that. So this was a, a major change in where the automobiles were for parades like this, for high society. And soon after that, it started changing that this was going to be a major change in how automobiles are going to be used and how it was going to expand where people could get out of the cities and can move out into the countries and move around much more readily. I'd like to add to that too. Um, I think one of the 
interesting points at this time is if you wanted to go from the city to anywhere else, uh, and if you wanted to go quickly, you were really confined to the railroad and the stops that the railroad had predetermined for you. Um, so there's this burgeoning sense of independence. Now I'm gonna get in my machine and I'm gonna drive where I wanna go even if that means to the top of the hill in the next town and have a picnic with my wife, um, that there's this great new sense of independence that doesn't require a horse. It doesn't require those kinds of horse, horsemanship skills. Um, and it doesn't mean that you have to go where the railroad is telling you. So it's actually sort of a mental shift in the idea of American independence, um, the advent of the motor car. Um, sorry, do you want to go now? No. You, oh, well, it's interesting too because in the images that you share, and also um, in what we know, what was a woman's role in driving at this period in time? Because I know that Tessie, I think Tessie drove her car down the Bellevue Avenue Parade, but for the most part, it was um, a a male-driven invention. Um, that actually is kind of part of my point. So um, Matilda Dodge, John bought her an electric vehicle, which is what a lot of women drove because they didn't have to do that crank start and have the strength for it. But going from Detroit out to Meadowbrook Farms, which was about an hour and a half, two hour drive at that time, her car would die all the time. Um, and so the 12 volt starter that he ended up putting in his vehicle later. Um, he ended up buying new cars for all of the women, Matilda's sister, because she had her old electric car. And um, after that, he had to get her a chauffeur because of the car. So, um, yeah. The early cars uh, that the women liked were the electric cars, because they were easier to drive. I mean, I have stick shift cars, they're difficult for me to drive right now too. So the electric car was a favorite car. And as you said, Tessie drove her car. She had a car. Alva Vanderbilt Belmont, she drove a car as well. And But when it came to racing, it was really men's only back then. And it, it really continued to be men only for many years. Uh, one of the people that I encountered uh, in doing simulations in one of my race cars was Janet Guthrie. And I remember Janet Guthrie, she was a breakthrough. She was one of the first woman drivers to run in NASCAR. And um, she always told me, she said she had a tough time breaking in, not because she didn't have the skills to do it, she just didn't have the opportunity. So uh, nowadays it was really not that the woman couldn't do it, it's just they weren't given the opportunity. And that lasted for a long time. We were actually talking about this just before we started is when uh, Charlie Kettering invents the uh, electric starter um, in the teens, uh, more and more women wanted to buy cars and wanted to drive cars. Uh, has anyone here ever crank started an automobile? Okay, a couple of hands. Hey, thank you. But it is a lot more challenging than you might think it is. And if it's still engaged when the car starts and you don't rapidly disengage it, it can come around really quickly. In fact, our joke at the America's Packard Museum, when we crank start one of the few cars that we have that does, we say, how's your dental plan? <laughs> um, because it's a dangerous affair. Um, so in fact, the self-starter and actually the 12 volt system, which Packard didn't implement until later, but Dodge was a pioneer with, um, really um, excited a lot more women and made it a little bit easier uh, for women to drive cars. And then you all have talked quite a bit about, um, you know, the American market. You've mentioned also European precedent that helped influence the American market. But how did the American market then influence European cars as well? And with the shows that the Dodges presented at, um, you know, what was the relationship with their their counterparts across the, the pond? I have a little bit of an answer that kind of goes to that and a little of the last, the last one. So the first car that was imported for um, citizen use to Europe after World War One, or during World War One, was actually for a female accountess. And she rode around and took uh, pictures and video of the war devastation as a charity project, um, which is one of those kind of roles that women were always kind of delegated to that like you can fundraise. Um, but she did it. She was actually going to these kind of war torn areas, but she did it in the Dodge Brothers car. Um, and it was the first car that was imported. Um, and I, Dodge Brothers, um, New Zealand and Australia, there's actually a huge contingent of vehicles 
there. I'm, I'm after the Gilded Age. It's a little bit difficult for me to say, but Dodge Brothers, they sent cars all over the world as soon as they, um, but I'm not sure how much, how much influence. Well, when you look at the Vanderbilt Cup races, the first four of them were won by European cars. And so it was really reinforcing the message that Vanderbilt had that the American manufacturers really needed to catch up. Uh, the last two Vanderbilt Cup races held on Long Island were won by the American locomotive uh, company that was uh, based in uh, right nearby Providence, Rhode Island. And the Alco then won the race. So uh, it sent a message back to Europe that the United States was improving and, and getting better. And so it did get a message back to Europe that they also had to continue to upgrade their cars as well, because the United States was starting to catch up. I think we'll move on to um, question and answer now. So Claire is over here with a mobile microphone. If you have a question, please raise your hand and she will bring it to it. We, oh, we're already, already here. Eager Beavers. Um, I was just wondering the Long Island Motor Highway, what is that today? Is that the LIE or is it, does it exist or is it gone or? Oh, do we have another hour here? <laughs> uh, the Long Island Motor Parkway uh, was built by Willie Kay and his business associates in 1908. He built it specifically for the Vanderbilt Cup races there, but he promoted it as a, a toll-free road that would go all the way about 48 miles from Queens out to Lake Ronkonkoma. And it was a toll-free road. It lasted about 30 years uh, from, uh, and this was about a 25 foot concrete road uh, that was pretty narrow. It was, only, it was only about 25 feet. In some areas it was about 50 feet. So it became pretty outdated and uh, state parkways started to be built. And it was a little curvy because they didn't have the right of, of, of purchasing the land. They couldn't take it over. They had to purchase it directly from the farmers. So it was uh, basically abandoned in 1938, but you had 45 miles of concrete and um, it was given uh, in lieu of taxes to the uh, Queens and Nassau and Suffolk County. And there are bits and pieces of uh, that parkway still exist today. They built 60 bridges as part of that and about 10 of them still exist, mainly in Queens. And I'm proud to say I'm the president of the Long Island Motor Parkway Preservation Society. <laughs> and uh, we started with eight people and we're up to about 450 people. And we, we basically try to preserve the history of this historic road. We have historic markers throughout. Uh, there's toll lodges associated with it. There's bits, of, some of these toll lodges still exist. So. Again, it, if you go to the website, you'll see the whole history of the Vanderbilt, of the Long Island Motor Parkway. Can I say something really brief? Yeah. I mean, you, you hit upon a really important point, both of you. Roads, right? This is the thing that they have more of in Europe than we have in the United States at this time. Good, navigable roads. And if I had another hour to talk about Henry B. Joy, um, who I very much sideswiped, and I'm sorry, I should have given more information. He is one of the um, driving forces behind the, the Lincoln Highway, which is going to be the first transcontinental road, right? It's going to connect New York and San Francisco. There've been a couple of transcontinental runs. Some of these cars, the Winton and then the Packard and a number of other manufacturers did 60 day treks on no roads across farmers' lands from San Francisco to, to New York. And um, this really underlines the needs for roads in the United States. And finally, people are catching on. Yeah, thank you. Great uh, presentation. I just had a, a sort of a speculative question for the entire panel uh, relating to Packard Vanderbilt and the Dodge Brothers. Looking at modern automotive reality, where we have the uh, the future arriving with driverless cars. I was just curious, based on your in-depth knowledge of the psychology of all these individuals, what you think they would perceive as uh, pluses or minuses of a world where the humans are no longer futuristically going to be involved in the driving. And, I, and my impression is that Mr. Vanderbilt would probably not be thrilled with that. But I'd be curious to the other people what they might think. And I'd just like to add, I was very curious about the, we're 100 years past the time period you're talking about. Yet we still have so many technical failures. You see Hyundai and Kia with the uh, ignition switches being hacked. You see Tesla's still 
obviously very innovative cars, but still having battery fires. And even our Formula One cars in the racing world, which are financed to the tune of a half billion dollars a year in some cases, are breaking down in the middle of races. And I'm curious what these great innovators and visionaries might have thought if you have any uh, insight into that based on the fact that technology, even 100 years later, we haven't perfected the automobile. You want that one? <laughs> I actually would love this one. Um, I used to work at an oil change. And so I know very, and I, I love car people and I, I have a, a great crew of people who help me take care of the cars. And it always is so amazing to me that the kind of car part that you could fix yourself and now you can no longer do it and my husband is a Cadillac um, designer um, today so he does interiors and he, he designs what they're going to look like but we actually um, have arguments quite often and he says that I'm like an engineer and I'm like no I'm like a historian and I want and so there's all these parts that I'm like but that's all run by a computer and what happens if it breaks and no one will ever be able to fix it and because he actually just last night told me I was like an engineer. So, and I don't think I am very much, but with a lot of these manufacturers being like engineers and being interested in the systems and the machining and the making of a part and actually doing and being interested in, I think that the, the automation of it would probably be a little bit difficult for, for at least the Dodge brothers to swallow. I think they'd be very interested in many of the other things that, that are coming, but I, I think the getting away from being able to fix parts and, and all of that, I think that would have been difficult too. And you're right. Willie K would have hated driverless cars. He, he felt that you really to test out a car, it had to be on the road. So even his races, he didn't like to have a racetrack just for uh, automobiles. He wanted it on the real road to test out the car. So he would hate the future of, uh, of cars. And getting to your question about, you know, Formula One cars and why do cars still break down today? And why do we have, I mean, we, with complex machines, um, our tendency is to always push the envelope of what these things can do. Um, and we want to create better performance, uh, more creature comforts, uh, more functionality, uh, greater, you know, overall performance. And this is why, uh, and also there's a whole sector of people who make their money on fixing complex machines. So we, we, we can't forget about them too. But um, no, we're always pushing the envelope. We're always trying to get more from these machines. Uh, and, um, and that's the reason why we continue to have failures. Hi, uh, my question is more geared to the, the concept of planned obsolescence. So one, do you believe, and this is more geared to Packard and Dodge, do you, do you believe it exists in the history of the automotive industry? And if you do, can you, can you maybe comment or talk to that in your historical context? Uh, am I allowed to badmouth Henry Ford now? Um, I mean, Henry Ford effectively created the idea of planned obsolescence. Um, he realized that there was a, a huge sector in parts right, that you could sell as much in parts and maintenance as you could in the actual sales of the car. Now, there were manufacturers like Dodge, like Packard, like Duesenberg, like a number of the luxury car manufacturers who wanted to build a solid car that would last for a very long time, that did not need to be serviced regularly in order to perform well, did not need replacement parts, did not have planned obsolescence. But as we march closer to World War II, almost all of the companies are seeing the revenue that's created by service and parts. And um, after World War II, you, you know, most people have had their car because cars really weren't built during the war. Uh, most people have had their car for eight years and all of the auto manufacturers wanted people to buy, 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 and then buy another one two years later, buy another one three years later. So planned obsolescence really came from Mr. Ford and spread like a virus into the, the automobile community over the next 30 years. That was great. Thanks. That was okay. Great. That was good. okay, unfortunately we've run a bit over. So I think just one more question tonight. I, I saw your hand. Hello, and thank you. I have questions related to the um, periphery of automobiles, i.e. gasoline and roadways. And I 
am aware of an estate in Long Island called Westways in Seacliff. That was where McAdam lived. And McAdam was the one that created the roadway surfacing compounds. And I don't, you mentioned concrete, but I don't know that McAdam is concrete. And I wonder when the first roadway started being paved, one, and two, gasoline. And these are all the elements that need to be available to make the cars go. And I know of Beaumont, Texas being called Spindletop because it became a major oil production area and back down in Texas. And there's, you know, Sunoco, Sun Oil Company and Mobile and all of those that are Texas related oil companies. But when did refining oil come and how was gasoline distributed? How was it distributed it from town to town? And how did, how did it get into the cars that were racing around Long Island and, and Newport? And that may be a whole nother lecture. I don't know. That's another, <laughs> that's another hour that we could do. But the McAdam, though, they, the film that you saw in 1904, that was raced on McAdam roads. So they, that's a, it was a gravel type of combination on the roads. And it was not only, it was on the major roads on Long Island, easily in the early uh, 1900s. So that was a 1904 race. Jericho Turnpike, which you saw there, Hempstead Turnpike, those were McAdam roads. And again, it was not only made for automobiles because there weren't that many automobiles, but it was really for the horses and the carriages that they, they made it a solid surface. And for the races, they would oil it down as well, so there wouldn't be as much dust for these cars as well. And for the gasoline, there were tire stations throughout the Vanderbilt Cup races where they had uh, gasoline tanks and they would refill it as well too. And they also had the tire stations where they would change the tires throughout the whole race too. And I would assume again, uh, for automobiles that there were different stations along these major roads where they did have some type of gas stations where they would, you could refill the gas. The first all paved road, concrete paved road was in Detroit. Um, it was just one mile stretch on, on Woodward. That was the first one in I think 1906 or 1907. Um, but it was actually a lot of these automobile uh, manufacturers and people involved in this business who were getting together in these clubs and they would be working on how do we create the infrastructure? How do we work with the police department to deal with if someone is speeding? Um, how do we fight laws? Because a judge has declared that no one's allowed to go over five miles an hour and that's ridiculous um so it, there are a lot of these it's um the first stoplight was in michigan too i have some early um like driving rules and they're funny there's like kids may play in the street don't hit them and there's like a photo of like a kid and um so there's so much that needed to be to be built so i think it is another lecture but um it, it is really fascinating and a lot of the things that's why you had a chauffeur number two. Oh, and even like road signs, because before that, there would be a chauffeur maybe taking you on these long distances. But then if you need people to go out for these pleasure rides, you need to figure out how to name the roads and how to tell people to get places um, and get back to where they came from. And so that was also in, in Detroit and, and Michigan um, that they had the first kind of big um, uh, street signs. But there's just a lot of infrastructure that had to be built in um, slowly. Good. Sounds like the beginning of lobbying for the auto industry. <laughs> um, thank you all so much for joining us this evening. Thank you again to our, our speakers. We hope to see you again on October 20th when we have John Henry speaking on the history of the Fall River Line, which was integral to Newport. Uh, and with that, please register online. If you have any questions, Claire and Kate are here for those. But uh, also, please welcome, we, we welcome you to a reception following uh, on, the, on the, um, the terrace. So again, thank you for your support. We look forward to seeing you again soon.